Good morning and happy Sabbath, North Orlando. It is, truly to, it is truly a blessing to be in the house of the Lord today, is it not? I have always struggled to understand what Jesus meant when he told the Pharisees in Mark chapter 2, verse 27, that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. I will admit, for a good portion of my life, I was indifferent and even resentful of the Sabbath. All I could think about was what I couldn't do, and I couldn't wait for the sun to set. But as I got older and went through high school and college, and the work got harder and the responsibilities increased, I began to look forward to the Sabbath, where I didn't have to be on go all the time. I could slow down and not have to worry about certain things. What Jesus was trying to explain is that the Sabbath should not feel like a burden. It was created for our benefit. We are to rest from our work and separate ourselves from worldly distractions. We are to reflect on how God has been with us throughout the week. And we are to remember the true rest that has been promised to us in heaven. So to wrap it all up, if the Sabbath feels like a burden to you, you're doing it wrong. Maybe you just need to reframe your perspective. As we begin our worship service today, let us ask the Holy Spirit to help us to rest reflect, and remember on this Holy Sabbath day. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for waking us up this morning and keeping us safely throughout this week, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit to help us to rest, reflect, and remember on your Holy Sabbath day and to get the blessing that you intended for us to receive from it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And since she isn't feeling well, like the kind, lovable person that I am, I decided to do the welcome for her. Yeah. Ah, I'm so happy to be in church again and to see so many familiar faces. I know this pandemic has kept us apart, but it will never break us from the connection that we have in the church. Amen? On behalf of Pastor Gross, I would like to extend to everyone a warm welcome. We are so happy to see those here and online to join us for service, and we do hope you are blessed by the message you receive today. To get started, we have some birthdays and anniversaries for this week. And for today's birthdays, this month's birthdays, sorry, we have Palma Joseph, Romarion Chris Holm, Lola James, Kyle Tuak, Valry Miller, Jordan Sheward, Parissa Butler. Jacqueel Robinson, Shavan Dixon, Samuel Gomez, if I pronounce that right, sorry, <laughs> Yugochuk Nikroni, Jason Sherwood, Naira Claint Clark, Corona Mackenzie Waldron, and I think that's it. All right, <laughs> sorry. All right, for the anniversaries we have this month, brother and sister Howard English, Amen. Brother and sister Satchel, brother and sister Solomon. Um, brother and sister Busano. Amen. We also have brother and sister Gibbons. And last but not least, brother and sister Waldron. Amen. 
And um, do we have Miss Brittany Padmore here? Uh, everyone, would you just wave? It's her first time being here. Thank you for joining us. Yes, thank you. All right, to end, I would just like to quote a song that says, have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. Have faith in God, he cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. All right, all right. Have a good Sabbath, everyone. Good morning and happy Sabbath. Some of us may have just come in from the morning dews. Great to see you. On behalf of Pastor Gross and Sister Gross, our First Lady, I take this opportunity to welcome us to church this morning. You may say, where is our pastor? As someone just asked me. Where is our pastor? So let me just share with you that although camp, Southeastern Conference camp is over, we still have other camps going on. And pastor is away at the Haitian Creole camp. He will be back soon. He wanted me to share with you some things. First of all, he wanted me to share that Dr. Marshalek, or Sister Marshalek, Elder Marshalek's wife, who is in Connecticut, she's not doing well. Please, please, please keep her in your prayers. And as we do the intercessory prayer later on, we will remember to pray for Dr. Marshalek. Secondly, uh, it's, if you think about it, today is July the 16th. Tomorrow, July the 17th, the Jamaican American Association will be having their ecumenical services right here at North Orlando Church starting at 4 p.m. You are all invited, especially if you're, you have Jamaican descent, Jamaican roots, or you are a Jamaican. Please come on out and also be involved in the program tomorrow. Also, again, July 16th is today. Are you yet thinking about school for parents of school-aged children? Three more weeks and it's back to school. Can you believe it? Three more weeks, and it's back to school. That's a scary thought, isn't it? It is, okay, Brother Tony said it's a scary thought, Elder Tony. So, we're gonna be posted, put in a box in the front of the, in the, in the foyer, for us, as you think about school and students who are returning to school, let us send them back with school supplies. And you may ask me, what is school supplies? If you remember, crayons and, and children's scissors and books and calculators. Remember also to put in some sanitizers and their mask. Do you realize that Florida is now in that medium to high range of COVID and all its subvariants? So make sure that you send as you buy things to take back over the next three weeks or three Sabbaths. Just remember, school supplies and back to school things that students will need. I just want us to look at each other, turn to each other. Behind the mask, it's very difficult to see who the individual is, but it's good to see Aaliyah's dad, elder brother Henry, sitting in the congregation. And I see Danny um, coming out. Um, Danny, I don't see you all the time, so it's good to see you. Uh, who else is he? Ooh, I think I may leave that for later. But it's great. Someone says El Sister, Sister Muriel Clark is in the house. She just raised her hand. 
So good to see you, Sister Clark, sitting beside your hubby today, and we know why that will be introduced later. So again, it's great to see um, Maxi. Who is that? Um, oh yes, Auntie Tom is in the house. Also, it's great to see. Who else? Who am I missing? Sister, Sister Mac. Look at her sitting right in front of me, right in her regular spot. Sister Mac, please just raise your hand. Yes, it's so good to see you. We don't often see you in church. Is it possible that this is your first Sabbath in the house? Or maybe, <gasps> Sister Mac, first Sabbath in two years. Hallelujah. You know, I want us to turn to Psalm 84. If you have your Bible, I just want to, Sister Mac, this is for you, especially. And it, so you don't have to be calling the people and say, I can't hear because you're right here with us. <laughs> Psalm 84 verse 1 says, How lovely is your tabernacle, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. And then it goes on, Sister Mac, bear with me, everyone. Verse 10, for it says, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. So, O Lord of hosts, blessed is a man who trust in you. And for our regular members and friends who you come week after week after week, it is so good to have you. I see Sister, um, Sister, hold on now, Sister Satchel's brother or cousin and his wife right here. Just Give us a, a wave, hallelujah. So good to see you. And again, okay, correction. She, they have their own name, brother and sister Spence. So good to have you. I hope you, the, the, your young people are doing great. And for our, vi our friends and worshipers who are virtually watching, we just praise you because yes, you don't have to be in the physical temple, but just connecting with us virtually in this technological age, we say welcome. May God truly bless you. Bless you very, very well. God bless you. Let us have a wonderful day. We know the Holy Spirit is with us because he promised, Jesus promised that when he left, he will be send the Holy Spirit to take care of us, to lead and to guide us and we know he's here with us. May God bless you. Have a wonderful, blessed Sabbath today as we worship together. Amen. Happy Sabbath. You are at the best church. Why do I say that? Why do I say that? We are united in worship, in fellowship, and in friendship. And I say that with all of my heart because I have experienced that, and I hope you do too today. I'd like to join our first elder in quoting from our, uh, the book of Psalm, and this is for everyone. It says, I will praise you, for I am what? Fearfully and wonderfully made marvelous are your works and that my soul knows very well does your soul know that everybody amen, amen. well i want you to remember this number what is the number 407 299 1342 that's a very important number because for all the hardworking men and women in here, communications, our clerk, you're going to need to call that number. If you want prayer, you're going to need to call that number. And it's in your bulletin, so don't miss it. 
We have Bible study that you can get. Um, you can call to drop your offering off. You can come by the church. You can send it in the mail. They'll talk all about that later on. You'll call that number if you want to rent our church facility. And look how beautiful and clean this place is. Also, if you haven't gotten your quarterlies and you want to stop by to get it, please come on by our church on Sundays between 12 to 2. If you have any information that you want to be added to the bulletin, you're going to need to call that number as well. But please do so by Mondays at 9 p.m. Or you can send an email to our church clerk, Sister Dora Jones, at N-O-S-D-A church clerk at A-T-T dot net. Now we're going to move on to our calendar of events. Yay! So one thing that happened last week was my birthday. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Dora. <laughs> anyway, um, Sister... With, um, Sister Thompson has already, Elder Thompson already uh, expounded on the Jamaica celebration. So I'll move on to our vacation Bible school, which is going to be on July 17th, the 24th, and the 31st. And it will be held virtually on YouTube. So please, 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 please have our children tune in. You know they love to be on the computer already anyway, and this will be something godly that can really allow them to appreciate the goodness of God and his grace and mercy towards us. On July 23rd, personal ministries day. There's going to be a prayer and fasting from 3 p.m. until 8 p.m. So some things are not moving because we haven't fasted. So let us join hands with the personal ministries department on July 23rd for their prayer and fasting day. I mean, their personal ministries day and their prayer and fasting during 3 till 8 p.m. On the 24th, this is also important, our health. We have a health clinic from 8.30 until 10 a.m. So please come on out. July 30th will be what, everybody? Youth slash education day. Amen? Where am I? Youth education day? Amen? Don't complain about your youth now because you got to support them. You got to appreciate them. You got to come out and support that program. August 5, our board meeting agenda items are due to the clerk. August 5, and on the 6th, we will again have another education emphasis and elders meeting after sunset. August 7th will be a board meeting at 10 a.m. And then on August 20th, we have what? Are you looking at your bulletin? What does it say? Men's Ministries Day. Come on now. Okay, so you're not going to cheer for our youth and you're not going to cheer for our men? Come on, guys. What does Ellen G. White have to say about men? She says, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. And we have men who will not be bought or sold in our church. And they have their men's ministry day on August the 20th, which will be, they'll have a lunch and learn. So everyone... Is it only for the men or everyone? Everyone is invited to come on out and support our men. Don't forget our sick and shut in members. Remember to keep them in your prayers. And I'm so happy that we still have our prayer line going. Tune in at 5.30. You can call on Zoom, but make sure that you're there because we have a lot to talk to God about. Also, we have uh, um, our regular programs like Let's Talk, the women's program on Tuesdays. We have something for the youth. So just remember, check your bulletins. Don't lose this because there's lots of helpful and valuable information inside. 
And as I leave you, let us remember to, oh, before I do that, I, how could I forget? Monica Forrest, where are you? Monica, I want to welcome you to church today. Everybody wave to Monica right there. Thank you for coming. And before I leave you, let's remember, call upon the Lord because he is worthy to be praised. Let's do that again. Good morning and happy Sabbath. This month's health nugget is preventing health-related illnesses. The Center for Disease Control, uh, according to the Center for the Disease Control, between the years 2004 and 2018, there were 9,829 extreme heat-related fatalities in the United States. That is an average of 702 deaths per year. And the majority of these fatalities were males, and a large percentage also were the elderly. However, within the elderly category, it was evenly distributed between males and females. So, where does the heat come from? Through metabolism and exercise, your body produces more heat than you are able to use. Your body can also absorb heat from radiant energy, such as the sun or a heater. So let's talk about the body cooling mechanism. Our body attempts to maintain its core temperature at 98.6 by doing two things. One, increased blood flow. The body defends itself from heat by increasing the amount of blood flow to the skin, resulting in an increase in skin temperature. This allows the body to rid itself of excess heat to the environment. The increased blood flow, however, puts and it causes an increase in the heart rate and therefore puts a strain on the heart. And the second mechanism is third is cooling through evaporation. When your body gets hot, you begin to sweat. And when the sweat evaporates, heat from the surface of your skin is removed. So let's talk about heat illness prevention. We want to drink fluids, especially water. Staying well hydrated is one of the primary methods to prevent heat-related illnesses. You want to drink plenty of water, 8 to 12 glasses for the day. And don't gulp it down. Instead, drink slowly and in small amounts. And you should not rely on thirst because the thirst is, a, is, not, is an unreliable indicator of dehydration. And of course, we need to avoid alcohol, caffeine, or high sugar beverages. These are all diuretics, and they can cause you to lose more fluids. Now, of course, if your physician limits the amount of fluid you should drink, or if you're on water pills, you need to consult your physician to see how much you should drink. What are some preventive measures we can take during extreme heat conditions? Air conditioning. Isn't it wonderful to be here? <laughs> Stay indoors in an air conditioned place. And if your home is not air conditioned, go to a public mall or some place that is air conditioned. Fans. Fans can help cool until the temperature reaches into the upper 90s. And at that time, you need to take preventive measures such as taking a cool bath or shower or moving to an air-conditioned location. Clothing. During extreme temperatures, temperature conditions, you want to wear lightweight, light-colored, and loose-fitting clothing. In addition, never leave anyone or pets in a parked, closed car during the hot summer. During the summer months, 
A parked, locked car can become as hot as 125 degrees Fahrenheit in just 10 minutes. Now, dozens of, we know that dozens of children die in the year, in the US, every year after being left alone in locked cars, where the temperature can rise very rapidly. In, nine, in 2021, 23 kids died of vehicular heat stroke, according to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. And we all know about the recent occurrence of a three-year-old boy who died after being left in a, inside a hot car in Florida, in South Florida, in the school's parking lot. So some of us have to be outside. What are some of the preventive measures we can take? You want to try to limit the outdoor activities as much as possible. And if you do have to go out, be sure to go out in the morning or the evening hours when the temperature is a lot lower than mid-afternoon. And try not to engage, or if you have to, minimize strenuous activity. Again, you want to consume water, at least two to four glasses per hour if you are outside. And of course, you want to avoid extreme cold, liquids because they can cause cramps. Rest often and stay in shady areas. And of course, you can wear a wide brim hat to protect your head and neck from the direct sunlight. Now, who are the persons who are most susceptible to heat-related illnesses? We have two groups, well, three groups actually, infants and young children. Their thermoregulatory mechanism in the body is not fully developed. So we need to constantly monitor infants and young children during hot weather. The elderly, persons 65 and over. We cannot adjust to sudden changes in temperature as well as young people. So we are more likely to, and we are more likely to have chronic medical conditions that upset our normal body's response to heat. So, and there are those of us who take prescription medication that impair the body's ability to regulate the temperature or inhibit the ability to perspire. The CDC recommends that we should check on the elderly at least twice a day in extreme conditions. And finally, persons with heart disease or high blood pressure, extreme heat will, add, will result in added stress on the heart. So let's talk about one of the heat-related heat illnesses, heat stroke. This is the most serious health problem for people in extreme heat conditions. It is caused by the failure of the body to regulate its core temperature. Sweating stops and the body cannot get rid of excess heat. And victims will die unless they receive proper treatment promptly. So what are the signs and symptoms? High body temperature as high as 106 or even higher. Hot, dry skin, usually red or gray color, and a rapid pulse. And of course, there is confusion, delirium, fainting, or seizures. So what do we do? Call 911 immediately and request an ambulance. We want to move the victim to a cool area, and we want to wet the victim down with a cool cloth, or we can fan the victim to increase cooling. If the person is conscious, we can give cool water. Other heat illnesses include heat cramps, which are painful muscle uh, spasms from electrolyte imbalance. Of course, you want to drink an electrolyte solution, you know, the sports drink that they have out there. And then we have heat rash. When sweat cannot evaporate easily and sweat glands become clogged or irritated, we get a rash. Uh, it's, there, it's characterized by small pink or red bumps, and it's very it's, there's irritation or prickly sensation or itching. What can we do? Well, we want to keep the skin clean and dry to prevent infection, and we want to wear loose cotton clothing take cool bath, and of course, over-the-counter lotions may help to, uh, to uh, ease the pain or the itching. Then there is heat exhaustion. Although not the most serious health problem, heat exhaustion is one of the most common heat-related ailments. It happens when a person sweats a lot 
and does not drink enough fluid or take in enough electrolytes or both. Of course, the person becomes sweaty, pale, clammy skin, sometimes flushed and weak. There is, however, normal body temperature and normal heart rate. And in severe cases, you might have vomiting and fainting. So what do you do? Put the person in a cool place, and of course, you want to give them electrolyte solution. And in summary, to prevent heat-related illnesses, we should stay indoors, preferably in an air-conditioned building, or stay in the shade. And if possible, we should remain indoors during the heat of the day, that is, in the mid-afternoon. We need to drink plenty of fluids, and I want to say plenty of water, because those sugary drinks are of no use to you during this time. Then we need to rest and minimize strenuous activity. The young and the elderly are the most susceptible to health-related illness, and therefore they, requ they require increased monitoring during extreme heat. Now, you know, we talk about the eight laws of health. You know them. It's, the acronym is New Start, and the S is for sunshine. Sunshine is wonderful. We should um, try to get at least 24 minutes or so of, of sunshine every day. Of course, as, we say, as I said earlier, you want to be in the sun in the morning when it's not as hot. So something that is good, sunshine, could also be bad for us. So we just have to make sure that we do everything God wants us to do in moderation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Let's all stand together as we sing Rejoice Ye Pure in Heart, hymn number 27.
Please be seated. Good morning, church, and happy Sabbath. Returning our tithes and giving our, our offerings is generally rewarding of parts of worship, in addition to providing the means of the continuation and growth of God's work. We symbolize our faith stewardship of all that is his, as well as the giving of ourself to the Lord. Here are four ways to give. Number one is online. Number two is in person. Number three is by mail, no cash. And number four is pick up. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to give our tithes and offering. God, bless the people who give and the people who didn't give. Bless the sick and shed members. Bless everyone in this church today and online. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Good morning again, North Orlando. It's time for children's story. Yay. <laughs> Let us pray. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of Jesus our Lord, children. And your scripture today, children, is taken from 2 Peter 1, verse 3, and it says, by his divine power, children, big and little, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him. So the question is, do you know him? All right. Now, we're going to come to a conclusion about different things that happen in our lives through an object lesson. And in this object lesson, we're going to use some water in a bag. We're going to use some colored pencils. Um, what else do I have? So I have the baggies, the pitcher of water, the colored pencils. All right? And I have my two helpers, which is what I was asking you, Sister Deanna, if it's okay if I use your, your two um, children. Yes, thank you, to do the illustration. I also have one for you, too, if, you, if it's okay with your mom. So um, we're going to use the baggies. So children, you can stand up with your baggies. Stand up and hold up your baggies face to church. Let me get one for you. OK. Come and get yours, baby. But you can stay by mommy. You know, we got to keep social distance. They're family, so they can, sit, they can stand together. There you go. Or if you want to stand on that side so they can see you. OK. So who can tell me what grace is? What is grace? And I'm not talking about Grace Miller. OK? I'm not talking about saying your grace when you eat. I'm talking about the grace that you get when you do not deserve something, okay? So, um, love. Somebody said love, amen. Because that is the greatest love. Grace and mercy towards us. Those two pillars. 
So the pencils represent the different things that come at us in our lives, things that are not so nice, um, like go ahead and go ahead and poke your bag with one of your pencils. Don't worry, I got paper towel. If there's an accident, go ahead and poke your bag. You too. Where's hers? Poke your bag, baby, with your um, pencil crayon or your pencil. Poke where the water is. Through where the water is. Poke through the water. Go ahead. Through the bag where the water is. Mm -hmm. Let me show you what I mean. Uh, he, says, he says, it's just water. It will dry. What if the water leaks out? It's just water. Let's try it together. On three. One, two, three. How did she pull? Oh, she took it back out. Hey. Listen, when, when it comes to, to you, when the problems of life come at you, don't take it out. Trust in the Lord. When you trust in the Lord, oh, wait, I got paper. Somebody took it out. When you give kids instruction, you got to remember the other part too. Don't take it out. Here you go. And I have a bag too that he can put it in. And it's just water. It's not going to harm you. There's plenty outside when you go outside waiting for you. Showers of blessings. So essentially, I'll use my bag for the illustration. Thank you so much, my little ones. Essentially, when things come at you, for example, and in the adults, you call it crucibles. Little children, we can call it holy pokes. When holy pokes come at you like bullies and sometimes we feel a little bit depressed or um, you fail the test or you get sick or you're taken away from your parents, can we think of any other? There are many things that can happen to us as we travel along this road. But remember that you already have everything that you need to sustain you to restore you, to keep you, to uphold you, to cover you. Come on, I can't hear you. Do you have any out there? To build you, to remake you, to make you new. You don't have to worry about the pokes that come because they're gonna come. They're gonna come. Mom, can you ask your baby girl what are some things that she might experience? What are some things that you might experience, little, my little sissy, my little sister, my little baby? What are some things that kids might experience in the back? My two helpers in the back, anything that you experience. But parents, you know what some of those things are. She said what? They hurt your feelings. Don't worry about it, baby, because why? God has given you everything that you need. Amen? So, as we go through today, remember that the, when you're poked at, God cre uses the pokes as plugs. He is teaching you. He is building you. He is helping you to get stronger and better. So, trust in the Lord with all your heart never lean to your own understanding and when you go through whatever you go through try to figure out what you can learn from it and grow from it close our eyes as we pray the lord bless you and keep you and the lord make his face to shine upon you the lord help you to be courageous and not to be afraid because the lord is with you wheresoever you go amen Happy Sabbath. Our scripture will be taken from John 3, verse 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. 
For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. we pray. Take our hearts and minds far away from the press of the world all around to your throne where grace does abound. May all eyes be dry our members whom we have not seen in a while. I'd like to acknowledge the Marshal X. Good to see you, Elder and Doctor. I'd like to acknowledge Sister Yard who has been traveling back and forth. Sister Yard would like to acknowledge you this morning. Sister Mackenzie who has been, has been, she hasn't been here in, um, in, in almost two years. Sister McKenzie, we'd like to acknowledge you this morning. Amen. And we have some, some young folk here. Um, didn't get the names, but on behalf of Pastor Gross, we'd like to acknowledge you this morning, okay? Amen. God is good. And all the time, God is good. Shall we bow for prayer? Shall we kneel? Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Can we kneel? Shall we kneel? The songwriter says, Some through the water, some through the flood, some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song in the night season and all the day long God leads his dear children along. And what a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. And oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. And that's all because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, for waking us up this morning, we thank you. For letting us see the sunshine of a brand new day, we thank you. For every mountain you brought us over, for every trial you see us through, we thank you. For every blessings, we give you praise. 
for being our provider, our friend, and our brother. We thank you. Forgiving us of our sins, Lord, and cleansing us of unrighteousness, we thank you. For sending your only begotten Son, Jesus, not to condemn us, but that through him we may have life and have it more abundantly. Father, we could search the world all over. We could look high and we could look low and find none like you. Father God, you are the same yesterday, today and forever. You are the God in the mountain, the God in the valley, God in the good times and God in the bad times. Father, this morning we pray for blessings. We pray for peace. We pray for comfort for our family. We pray for healing. We pray for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. The Father, touch every person visiting here this morning. Father, you know the desires of their heart. Father God, if you can use anything this morning, use your manservant, Elder Clark. Hide him behind the desk, hide him behind the cross. May the words be meet for such a time as this. Father, we lift up our sick and shut in members. Father, we lift up those members who are seeking employment. Father, for the roof over our heads, we thank you. And not only for the roof, Lord, but for AC, air condition, we thank you. We lift up Sister Johnson, who will be having bypass surgery sometime in the near future. Remember Sister Carol. Remember Pastor Gross, wherever he may be this morning. And then, Lord, when you would have come to claim your people, it is my prayer that each and every person watching online, each and every person under the sound of my voice, will hear the words, well done, and will have a place in your kingdom. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Let this congregation say amen. amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. speaker this morning needs no introduction. He's my good friend. Uh, we have been friends for over 30 or more years. Our children went to the same school from kindergarten to university. He is my doubles partner in table tennis. Uh, you can ask anyone around here about us. Um, as a matter of fact, we have been dubbed the goats. <laughs> Greatest of all times. <laughs> Greatest of all times. That's Ella Clark and myself. Ella Clark is married to the beautiful Muriel Clark. Can we give it up to Muriel? Can we just give it up to Muriel? Um, a lot of you may not know it. Most of us here at church know that Sister Clark 
was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Doctors sent her home stating, we can't do anything for you. But we serve a mighty God. Amen. Mirette Clark is here today. Amen. And the Clark has two wonderful professional children in Paula Clark and Tassine Clark. They have a um, wonderful son-in-law, John. It's good to have you here today, John. The next voice we will hear, church, after the meditation by his daughter, Tassine Clark Adesitima, will be Elder Paul Clark. Give him your undivided attention when he comes. Thank you. Happy Sabbath, church. It's definitely a blessing to be here. Um, after what Uncle Ron said about my mom, um, it's a blessing to see her be able to have strength in her body and um, strong enough to come out to church. This is her first time in church since her diagnosis in February last year. And so um, I just praise God and um, I know it's just his grace and mercy that has brought her this far.
for a minute I thought Elder Sutherland was going to put that thing there for me to stand. But, but, but thank you, Elder Sutherland. <laughs> Happy Sabbath, North Orlando. It is just so good to be home. <laughs> you know, not until Pastor Gross mentioned it to me um, when I was trying to stall the appointment today. He said, man, you have been here in a long time. Yes, I did not realize it's been two years and about four months since I've been here. And I, I don't know it's coincidental The Sister Mac is here uh, after two years. <laughs> Somebody hinted to me that, no, they haven't seen her all this while. But she's just one of those who believe in um, putting her money where her mouth is. You know, she's been praying for me every morning on the prayer line. So she's uh, putting some action into the prayer. She's come out to support me. Thank you, Sister Mac. You know, it's, um, it's Kaylee, uh, I could hardly recognize Kaylee. Two years ago, um, I was taller than Kaylee. I saw her this morning and I, she was grown up to be quite a young lady. And I see Seth, Seth is growing so tall too, man. If I stay away another two years, he's gonna be taller than me too. <laughs> Elder and Sister Marshlake has really been good to see. Oh, Sister Marshlake is here. When did she come in? She's, Good to see you, uh, Sister Marshlake. <laughs> uh, we understand the crucible you're going through, uh, Shirley and Elder Marshlake, and uh, our prayers, of course, are with you. Uh, this is quite some time. Uh, my message this morning is entitled, How Are You Trending? And I've chosen that topic as an, uh, to give an analogy with my wife's illness. You see, my wife still has that. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't know. I didn't expect this. I'm sorry. It's, you know, um, what's so funny is that um, since my wife diagnosed diagnosis, come on. Since my wife's diagnosis, um, I have not seen water well up in her eyes one time about her condition. No, you explain that to me. My daughter, we're, we're crying. Um, I have gained so much strength from her. My belief in God has been strengthened because of this uh, episode. But if I can get back, if I can compose myself and get back. No. It's, it's, an, it's an aggressive cancer, I'm told. Everybody talks about it. You know, um, but praise be to God, the doctors are pleased with every test and scan that she has been doing, and she's getting better. You see, when she was first diagnosed, her, her cancer count was 231. After hearing the prescription for treatment by the oncologist, my wife decided God has to have something better. She's not going to go through that. It, it wasn't the doctor's um, uh, Elder Ron that gave up on her. <laughs> she decided to put it in the hands of the Lord and not in the hands of the oncologist. So we went for two years, I'm sorry, two weeks at the Adventist, Adventist Lifestyle Center in um, Colorado called uh, Eden Valley. And after learning how the body, how God designed the body to treat diseases, any form of disease, and following the protocols they did for those two weeks, we came back and we went back to the oncologist. She was startled. Because instead of, instead of spiking like it was expected to do, her cancer count went down to 230. And it's just, just one, but that's significant because it's trending in the right direction. <clears throat> now, since that, since that time, it's gone down to uh, under 100. The tumor itself. The 
the tumor itself has been reduced by about half its size. She is trending in the right direction toward remission and recovery. Keep praying that it continues because the tumor is still there but losing its steam. I can truly say that my wife's courage and faith has strengthened my faith too. So I'm actually praising God for the experience as bad as it sounds. First, let me thank the North Atlanta Church family along with the prayer line. Because unlike common practice, we chose not to hide the fact that my wife's life could be quickly shortened. So we re requested the prayer of the saints. Prayer is not one of the protocols of traditional medicine, but what a powerful medicine it is to know and hear people of God praying for you seven days a week. I'm giving a, a punch for the prayer line. Seven days a week without tuning into the prayer line makes one weak. <laughs> We've been blessed. Not only did we receive an outpouring of prayers, but the care and empathy we received made my wife say to me one day, she did not know she was so loved. So thank you, North Orlando, for the support, the empathy, the envelopes, and the love and prayer shown during our ongoing crucible. One of these days, she herself will come up and share the miraculous journey uh, with you. This is just a drop, backdrop to the message I have for you today. My question is, how are you trending spiritually? My message today is more like a testimony than a sermon. So if, if I can ask you to bow with me now as we pray. Father, make my words, the words of my mouth, the testimony I share today be filtered by your Holy Spirit so that it be clearly understood and my objective to have everyone strive for a closer relationship with you and claim the assurance of salvation by the grace of God uh, be achieved. Amen. My opening text, if I could have uh, the screen, I'll put that up there. Matthew 5, verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect. Well, that's another one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, the one that I have, I must have got something. Oh, it was supposed to be 548. I'm sorry. Um, my fault. Uh, be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. And also 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scripture says, you must be holy because I am holy. I am not about to do an exegesis on these texts. I'm going to leave that for the theologians. But I want to show you the impact that the texts like these have had on the understanding or misunderstanding, misinterpretation of the gospel, the good news of salvation. I thought it was so coincidental uh, that the children's story by Sister Althea fits so nicely in with uh, my message today, and she didn't know uh, what it was all about. And of course, my daughter for singing that beautiful song on grace. Thank you, Tess. See, I was raised in a Christian home, having to get up early in the morning for family worship before, and, and, and evening before going to bed. I got baptized, as I would say, through the influence of my elementary school teacher, Mrs. Ina Mae Palmer. And about a year uh, before attending high school, or the year that I attended high school, I got baptized. And I felt pretty ready for heaven. But by the end of high school, or close to the end of high school, uh, there was a lot of turbulence in my, in my head. I mean, I didn't get into big trouble, but enough trouble to know how imperfect I was. Like when I got a sound spanking, a sound caning, it was called those days, uh, by my principal, because a desk tipped over due to my carelessness. I also remember me and my team, my tent mates at uh, the youth camp we had in uh, Westmoreland, Jamaica, by the youth director because we were laughing when it was supposed to be quiet 
at bedtime in the, in the tent. He was passing by when he heard this commotion. And all of us <laughs> got a whipping from uh, the youth leader then. Not to mention what I got at home from my parents. <laughs> Those of you from Jamaica, you probably know what I'm talking about. See, as a youth, you see the justice of God in our parents and authority figures. There's no doubt that reaching the level of perfection uh, to be saved would have been a stretch in my mind then. But thank God for Christian education, Christian friendships. I was able to maintain that crucible I was going through mentally. After not finding a job after high school and with little funds, I matriculated at Western East College, now NCU, with some godly friends. The late pastor, Dr. Garnet Spence, was quite a mentor who had just taught me in high school, but now we were freshmen together in college. Because we matriculated together, I was placed in one of the off-campus houses, which was reserved for older and more senior students, not for a 17-year-old. <laughs> For housemates, I had great Christian pastors in the making, such as Pastor Alan Hayes. Some of you, um, what, he was your church pastor uh, at Grand Conference, I think. Pastor Daniel Williams, Pastor Harold Cameron. Also, um, uh, pastor currently in the D.C. area, Dr. Lincoln McKenzie. Joining us later was a new convert from West Kingston, who had just been converted from a life of gang and crime. He shared with us how he was delivered from gang-related shooting because uh, sometimes he said that he and his uh, buddies would be running and he would hear bullets pass in his ears and his, his friends beside him falling, dead. But somehow a friend of his gave him one of her books, early writings. I didn't think that to be a missionary book, but he said when he read that book, Man, his eyes were open. He never knew about that kind of world when he read about heaven, what heaven is going to be like. He had no, 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 he had no idea about such ideas. He decided that's got to be a better life than he's living. And so he gave his heart to the Lord. But shortly after, he came and matriculated to be a minister at Western East College. Now, experiences like that along with the week of prayers that they had at the college, um, made me decide that staying in the church was a safer path than otherwise, even though I still was without the assurance of salvation. It did help that my job after I graduated at the age of 19 was teaching at the Seventh-day Adventist High School, gaining the trust of uh, the principal that had caned me in high school. <laughs> That helped in keeping me active in church and trying to be the best example I could muster to the young people I was working with. I'm sure that God now had laid out a path for me because he wanted to spare me from the crucibles that result from living a life of godlessness that I saw through many of the kids I grew up with in my neighborhood. You see, all around me there was a lot of marijuana smoking, even by some of the students I taught. But guide, God guided me through completing my studies later on and gave me a lovely family and brought me here to North Orlando where the mental, spiritual transformation actually took place. So today with a level of confidence, <clears throat> but even more so to bolster my own confidence in the gospel, I'm going to say I am now saved by the grace of Jesus Christ who shed his blood for me in Calvary 2,000 years ago. And had I been the only one, he would have died. Praise God, he did it for you too. He did it for my children and your children and for all humanity. I'm hoping someone today gets convicted of that assurance and leads with a song in the heart that says, how cheering is the Christian hope while toiling here below. It will buoy your spirit up, Elder Marshall, while passing through the crucibles of this present life. 
I would like to cite some examples from the Bible that I have gleaned from our Sabbath school lesson. Uh, men who have lived very imperfect lives but will be in the kingdom. Let me first say that we did not choose to be imperfect. We are born with that imperfect DNA. We all must be striving for perfection because the consequences that we incur as a result of our imperfections and not because your perfection is going to save you, but because of the consequences that you will reap from your imperfections. I'd like that to sink in for a while. Our perfection is not a tool for salvation. It will not save us. That is not my opinion. That is coming straight from the word of God. If your perfection could save you, then Jesus would not need to come down here suffering the humility he did and dying on that cruel cross. We are saved by the grace of Christ and that alone. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest you should boast. This text should be etched and riveted in our minds, especially as we face the crucibles of this life. If I can use the story of Adam and Eve to illustrate my point, as long as you understand I'm not a theologian, it's just my way of understanding <clears throat> and testifying of the plan of salvation. And pray it gives hope to someone struggling on the Christian pathway. See, Adam and Eve got a beautiful garden to live in. It was a free gift. They did nothing about its construction. They could have done nothing to deserve this gift because it was all divinely presented to them after they were created. Of course, they were given certain conditions to, re to remain in possession. Stay away from just one tree. One tree. All Adam and Eve needed to do was to maintain that lofty relationship of trust and fidelity to one person nothing else. Instead, they chose to listen to an imposter, which raised doubts about the goodness and veracity of God, and more importantly, broke that relationship, that strong bond that they had with the divine. They could not remain possessors of the gift because they broke the contract. Be it known, however, that they repented. And by the grace of God, we can look forward to greeting them in the earth made new. However, the consequences of their decision have had a devastating effect on all humanity, on planet earth, and possibly the universe at large. You see, our DNA was altered, and so we all now have, without choice, that propensity to sin. But praise God, a second Adam came, who was promised from the foundation of the world. He would reconcile humanity and rebuild that relationship. We have now died in Christ, and as long as we accept his grace, we have the assurance of life with him forever. We now, with the gift of salvation, are required to behave as saved people in order to maintain that bond that loving relationship with Jesus. But our circumstances as safe people are so different. Some of us started out in pleasant home environments, like myself, poor, but the Spirit of the Lord was in my house. You were taught about the love of Jesus and the examples of your parents and others in your life were positive. But some of us, unfortunately, started life in very harsh, unloving, unforgiven, and abusive circumstances. Jesus is offering you to the free gift too, but conforming to the behavior of a safe person will not be the easiest task for everyone based on circumstances. And that's why I'm suggesting to you today that you accept Jesus first and foremost and surrender your life to him and let him transform your life 
over the period of your lifetime. It is called sanctification. And on that journey, we will never be on the same level. Some of us are, are going to be growing faster than others. Some of us have better support systems. But as long as you are trending upward, praise the Lord, your salvation is secure. Peter, a rough, uncouth fisherman, Jesus called him. And he responded positive, positively to the call. Jesus now had to hew and cajole the, the horrible tendencies that, that he had to transform him into a more refined person who could share the gospel as Jesus intended to mold him to do. Once he got so angry, he was accused of following uh, Christ. He used real foul, dirty fisherman's language to show he was not a follower of Christ for fear of retribution. Another time, he drew his sword and cut off the ear of someone who was trying to arrest Jesus. It took a lot of patience and time for Jesus uh, to help Peter to get, get over his vile temperament. So much better had he gotten that he, along with other disciples, had the Holy Spirit poured on them at Pentecost so they could powerfully proclaim the gospel, baptizing over 3,000. His life was trending upward. But was he perfect at this time when the Holy Spirit was poured upon him? I, I guess some of you are going to think, yes, yes, he was. Check again. From Scripture, God had to continue working on Peter. And I want anyone that thinks that he or she has an ascertained perfection to be very careful because that could be a setup by the devil. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed he fall. As proof of what I'm trying to say, Peter proved to be a racist after Pentecost. Don't you remember that? For want of a better word, I said racist because discrimination at that time was not against another race, but another group of people, you know, the Gentiles, non-Jews. He refused to mingle with them, to treat them as equals. So God had to show him in a vision that God is no respecter of persons, but all are equal at the foot of the cross. And as a safe person, he must treat all human beings fairly. Do not lose your way because of the fallibility or the imperfection of others. Always keep your eyes on Jesus because he alone will never fail you. Contemplate this question. Had Peter accidentally died or was crucified before he was able to give up his racist practices or even his foul mouth behavior? Would he have gone to heaven or hell? Think about it for a while. <laughs> I'm suggesting to you, during all those struggles that Peter was going through, at any given moment, he would have been with Jesus for eternity. Because his life was trending upward. It is never, never our works that determine our salvation, but our relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, I hope someone understands what I'm saying. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And all these good qualities will be, will be in time added to you. But if you fall short, the robe of Christ's righteousness will be there to cover you and declare you perfect at the throne of God. 1 John 2 verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Not only have I learned a lot and been impacted by Elder Miller's Bible class and a book that I have treasured by the late Jack Secure entitled Beyond Belief, um, I was also convinced about my, posi my position uh, from a testimony that Elder Boyne, remember Elder Boyne? Late Ellerborn, I should say, that he shared with us right here at North Atlanta before his passing. I will never forget his story. He shared that when he got baptized, 
into the Seventh-day Adventist church, he was an addictive smoker. He, could, he couldn't give up smoking. He would, of course, not do it in public anymore because, you know, if the saints saw him, what would be the result? So he would go to, a, to the outhouse in his yard and there he would get his nicotine fixed. But, you know, he got tired of not being able to, uh, to conquer his... Uh, see, in those days, I guess, that you never had the patch and everything like that that he could have used. Um, so in that outhouse, he... Act, I don't know if he went on his knees, but he cried out to God and asked the Lord to deliver him from that addiction. Elder Boyne said, man, that day that he wrestled with God in that outhouse... He left a changed person because he never had the desire for nicotine anymore. My question to you is, what if Elder Boyne had died before he was able, before he gained the victory over the cigarette habit? Would he have been destined to hell? I'm hearing different answers out here. I, I think I'm hearing the same answer. I am putting it to you too. I'm going to agree with you 100%. Uh, well, some of you might be asking, first of all, how long uh, was that struggle going on? But does it matter whether it's a month, uh, a year, or two years? I suggest to you that Elderborn was already saved the moment he turned his heart over to the Lord, which is called justification. And so he would have been in that first resurrection. The moment he accepted Christ and he hungered and thirsted after righteousness. His salvation was assured. He was not smoking because he wanted to. He was smoking because of the propensity we all have to sin. He was struggling, but he kept his relationship with Jesus. And I think that's the answer right there. I can imagine if he had been caught by one of those zealous church members. He might have been... This fellowship, yes. And that's why I like the poem penned by Liz Newman. I think you have that uh, poem. We witness other people's storm from the shelter of our own perspectives. Let's be mindful that we don't add the cold rain of judgment to their already soaked spirit. That's why the Lord asked us in his word to let him be the judge. Let's instead excel in loving one another and be less judgmental because we don't know what struggles and crucibles people are going through. Are you struggling with a demon today? Something you would hope Pastor Gross doesn't hear about. Just don't give up. Keep fighting and praying. And make sure you keep that relationship with Jesus intact. And please remember that being a Christian demands constant progression, not perfection. It was interesting uh, as I was preparing the message this week and to hear Elder English in the, on the prayer line said, say the very same thing. That's when I knew that this is a message the Lord wants me to share. To Jesus... The Christian life wasn't about being perfect, but about being perfected. So I say, never give up on Jesus, because your salvation has been assured, not by your own merit, but by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on Calvary. That's the essence of the gospel. Don't refute or refuse that gift. Put the horse in front of the cart. Accept Jesus first and be saved today. And let the chips of your sinful tendencies fall where they may as you struggle to live the saved life in Jesus. Keep the relationship going. Last quarter, we studied the lives of some goats in the Bible. The greatest of all time in the Bible. <laughs> I don't know if you picked up like I did. It was a wonderful study last quarter. Now, did you notice how sordid uh, the lives of so many of those patriarchs were? They all practice polygamy. And that's never God's intent. He put Adam and Eve in the garden. Just one man, one woman. 
and we later saw that instruction in, uh, in when the elders were chosen. They were supposed to be husbands of one wife. So how come these, how come these patriarchs uh, had so many women? But yet God used them for his purpose. You see, those patriarchs allowed the pagan cultures around them to influence and impact their own behavior. And that's why they had so many turmoils in their generation and the generations that followed. That's why I'm such a strong advocate of making sure you have a personal re relationship with Jesus and have him direct your life, not the culture or popular behavior around you, but to know what God is asking and expecting from you as a safe person. You know, the Ten Commandments is really just a baseline to show you what God is like and what living for him looks like. But to be one with Christ will involve far more than just keeping the Ten Commandments. Keeping the commandments is an outward show of goodness, which is often conflicting with what's actually happening inside. God asked Abraham to pack up and leave his homeland, his kindred, and go to a country because God had a special assignment for him. He later told him to offer his son a sacrifice like the pagans around him regularly did. This is not something that Jews did, but they, they, the pagan nations did that. And God was asking Abraham to do that. Abraham proved that he was indeed a man who trusted God and would do all that Jesus required, uh, all that God required of him. Abraham did not choose to comply in order to be accepted by God. He was already a saved man because he accepted that free gift. As a saved child of God, he willingly, painfully agreed to do whatever God asked him, even offering it his only true ear. When you have the assurance of salvation, you don't hesitate to do what God says because of that tight relationship you have with him. He might even ask you to do something that's, that he's not asking anyone else to do. It might be just a test of your loyalty to show you where you are and to prepare you for tough times ahead. The most classic case might be the case of the rich young ruler who went to Jesus wanting to brag about the fact that he kept all the commandments from his youth. He was strictly keeping the laws of God, but without a relationship with God. Like us keeping the law of the land. Matthew 19, verse 16 through 20, we see the story of the rich young ruler. And someone came to him, I'm reading, uh, can we have that on the screen now so the members can follow, thank you. And someone came to him and said, teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, what are you asking me about? What is good? There is only one who is good. But if you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Hmm. Jesus was trying to teach this young man. He was trying to reach this young man, rather, where he was. Because Jesus is the author of the gospel. He knew he grew up in the Jewish tradition and was already a commandment keeper. Notice G Jesus even chided him for asking him about being, a good, uh, about being good, because only God is good. And you see, this, this young man wanted to show Jesus that he was good. Uh, so he asked, which, ones are the, which one of the commandments are you talking about? And of course, Jesus went through all the commandments. And the young man proudly said, all these I have kept. What am I lacking? He's expecting Jesus to be celebrating him now, right? Jesus said to him, if you want to be complete, go and sell your possession Give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come follow me. Have a relationship with me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. He was rich. He wasn't about to part with his riches for nobody. That young man was indeed a good man by any human standard, and undoubtedly to himself, he felt he was already perfect. The one thing he really lacked was total surrender to Jesus. In other words, he needed a relationship. 
with God. When you surrender to Jesus, you will give up anything, least of which your, your, your wealth. You will be willing to give up your very own life, as many through the centuries have done. If you've been following on, uh, the great controversy, Huss, Jerome, uh, and of course the disciples who all gave their lives for Jesus. You will give up your own life. We don't, say, we don't say we're good people. We ought to say we are graced people. We cannot be good by ourselves. It's only with God that we can attain any level of goodness. And that is not what guarantees our salvation. Because it was already guaranteed by Jesus and Calvary when we died with him or in him. So the question you might be asking is, what's the purpose of trying to do good if our goodness doesn't qualify us for salvation? Ah, isn't that a good question? You pay your tithes because you are, you pay your tithe not because you want to go to heaven, but because you're already heaven bound. Didn't get that. Your tithe pain, fidelity to your wife, keeping the Sabbath, abstention from drugs, those things will not get you to heaven. It's a choice you must make because you are already a saved person. Let's take a look at the life of Joseph that we recently studied, my new hero in the Bible. Joseph had the same hereditary tendencies to sin like his parents and siblings, but he formed a bond with the God of his youth that stayed with him throughout his childhood and adult. Choose to, choosing to do good after committing to that close relationship with God paid great dividends for him. Even when being a good, morally pure person, his freedom was threatened because he still maintained that he could not sin against his God. Think for a moment because, you know, there were other, other men who would be in heaven like David who just saw a woman that looked you know, naked and he couldn't con control himself. He was threatened and yet he decided that he could not sin against his God. Think for a moment, had he chosen to sleep with his master's wife just to avoid going to, going to jail, he would have become not just a regular slave but also the personal slave of his master's wife because he could never say no again with any authority. He was actually freer in prison than he would have been in part of his house. God would now probably have to raise someone else to save the children of Israel to preserve the covenant relationship with Abraham. But because he chose to do right both in part of his house and in choosing one wife unlike his forefathers, his children had a whole lot less traumatic and dysfunctional issues than his siblings and other family members. William Shakespeare in the book The Merchant of Venice says, the sins of the father are to be laid upon the children. But, but Moses actually said the same thing in Exodus 34 verse 7. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. What that is saying is that sin has consequences. Sin has consequences. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children out unto the third and to the fourth generation. When you choose to do wrong, you suffer the consequences of your wrong choice as well, not just you, but your family your descendants suffer. That's why we have to do the best we can uh, with our imperfections. The world is in a mess today because Abraham and his wife went against God's will and had a child outside of God's will. Even though the forgiven God has by his grace saved Abraham and but his children down to our time are suffering the consequences of that bad choice. The wise man Solomon, you know about him, 
he suffered dearly from his extravagance. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 17 says, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me, for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. A man who had it all, but yet at the, at the end he hated life because of the moral choices he made. But by the grace of God, he admitted his errors, was forgiven, and will be in the kingdom of God. That's why I like the words of Billy Graham when he said, Thank God for his grace, for without it, we would have no hope. Sister Thorpe, thank you for that uh, text that, that, you know, didn't know that I'm preparing this message. She sent that and fit in so nicely. It doesn't matter how deep in sin your past has been. The cleansing blood of Jesus can wash it all away. And you can be free in Jesus by, by claiming his gift of grace today. That's right. I'd like to conclude with a story Pastor Jack Sakir uh, gave when he was invited here by Elder Miller. Uh, he, he did a two-week week of prayer. I think he did it twice. And by the way, if you're not attending the Bible class, you're depriving yourself of the water that the woman at the well embraced. And you won't know what you're missing until you've tasted and drank because it releases that freedom promised to all who accept the truth because it's the truth that truly sets you free. <laughs> well, the story goes something like this. Uh, Pastor Sakira and his family lived in Uganda when Idi Amin took power in that country and decided to get rid of all the Indians because they were, I guess, the merchants, they were the wealthier class, I don't know. Uh, took, took away, froze their assets, and Pastor Sakira, who was pastoring there, he and his family had to flee, uh, and he went to Ethiopia. And the pastor who welcomed them in Ethiopia said, Brother, you don't have to worry, because that could never happen in, in Ethiopia, because it's a Christian country. It was one year later that that pastor had to eat his words because there was a revolution in that country. They shut down all the schools for two years and all the young people were ushered, were sent off to a camp, a re-education camp, where they're going to be brainwashed. And they were told every morning, like you would have devotion in the morning, well, their devotion went something like this. Um, God is an imposter. Everybody had to repeat that. God is an imposter. Christ is the devil. Those who refused were stoned or shot to death. There were about 8,000 Adventist youth in those camps, and only one was martyred for refusing. Those young people, well, they, they, uh, they, 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 the pastors, the church leaders ask, what happened? What happened? Those young people knew all the doctrines of the church. They were very versed in the knowledge of the Bible. The conclusive answer is that the young people had no assurance of salvation. Why would they die now without the certainty of eternal life? And that's where I was as a young high school senior. Had I been confronted with the same choices, I'm sure that would have been my choice too, to live for sure than to die with uncertainty. The same question goes out to all of us today. If you were forced to give up the Sabbath for a man-made day because you were not allowed to buy or sell, or worse, your life was threatened, unless you gave up your faith, would you make that choice to die with, without the certainty of your salvation in Christ Jesus? I'm sure your, your focus will be on your shortcomings, the sins which so easily beset us, instead of what Christ has done for you and Calvary. Let me assure you that that day is coming, and I believe it's nearer than you can imagine. A lot of you, a lot of us, did not think January 6th could ever happen 
in the bastion of democracy, the USA. As an uninspired elder, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna predict that if the Congress is controlled by conservatives, Christian conservatives, and the upcoming elections as predicted, we will have a national Sunday law within the decade. I, just, just a prediction. I mean, I'm, you know, no guarantees. <laughs> About half the country is up in arms against the Supreme Court decision, Roe versus Wade. And as Christians, we have to agree that it's, it's unfortunate that the slaughter of the defenseless unborn child had gone into such a big industry with clinics all over the place. While I'm sure it's appropriate in some instances to intervene like the 10-year-old impregnated by a grown man or a wife, I mean a mother whose life is threatened, but having health clinics with the sole purpose on so many blocks just to terminate life flies in the face of Christianity and medicine which is supposed to be to preserve life, not to take life. But I want you to go a little deeper. Look at the broader sinister issue involved here. When the pilgrims fled Europe, they chose America for the freedom to worship as their conscience dictated, free from the coercion faced in Europe. The Catholic Empire controls so many governments in Europe until the Protestant Revolution of the 16th, 17th century, started by Martin Luther. Catholicism has been yearning to reclaim that power since that time. When President Kennedy, the first Catholic president to occupy the White House, was inaugurated, he had to pledge not to allow his faith to determine his governance. But the church, clandestinely, cleverly, has used and possibly infiltrated Protestant churches to move their agenda, which has always been to control governments like they did before the Reformation. And by the way, in case you don't know it, the Catholics have the strongest birth control. That's not what I want to say. They, you know, they're very strict. Um, of course, they are 100% against abortion, but they also don't even want you to use con uh, contraceptives. That's how strict they are. The only form of contraception that is allowed by the church is the rhythm method, natural method, no artificial method. Just, want to, just wanted to share that. But, but what I'm trying to say is that no one would suspect a Catholic agenda me being pushed by evangelicals because the distinctive lines between Protestants and Catholics have largely been erased, and they are fast getting a stranglehold in this country. Did you know that six of the nine justices, Supreme Court justices, are avowed Catholics? One of the two Protestants was raised Catholic, and the other one is Jewish. Do you know what faith has the largest majority in Congress? The Catholic Church, as a church, has the largest majority. It says Catholics have the, the biggest denomination of, among the Christian faith in the Congress and two of the most powerful offices in government, with President-elect Joe Biden and Speaker Nancy Pelosi, both Catholics. There is a power dynamic not seen since the early 60s when John F. Kennedy and John McCormick made history as the first Catholic president and speaker. The issue now will not be whether you're liberal or conservative, because as a minority religious group, you'll just be out of the loop and lose all your rights when church and state have clasped hands together and are united. Will So unless you make your calling and election sure, you will have to face that crucible. Will you stand up for Christ like the three Hebrew boys who most certainly were sure of their salvation? Or will you bow down to the image of the beast? I pray today that we will stand like the brave because we have accepted Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And we are sure, not wondering if, but sure 
that as long as you have accepted his grace freely offered, we will be assured of a place in his kingdom. Not because we're good and perfect, but because Christ is good and perfect. And he will close us with his perfect righteousness as he presents us to his Father. Let's claim that gift today. My daughter will do an appeal song. I appeal to you this morning, I would really like to invite all of us to tune in this afternoon to the Bible class. 
Because trust me, a better understanding of the gospel creates a stronger, better relationship with Jesus. You don't need to leave home. And I think they'll have the number on the screen. But the grace of God allows you to truly be free. It will truly make you live a richer Christian life. And it will give you the strength to stand up whenever you are tested, whenever crucibles come your way. And that's why we have to, we must accept God's grace because that's the, that's the way to salvation, the only way. May God bless us as we commit ourselves uh, to live in for him, live in with him, and be overcomers. See you in the kingdom. <laughs>
To God be the glory, great things he hath done. Let us close with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the time we spent in your courts today. We thank you for the word and the message that you sent to our hearts today because we have been uplifted by your spirit. Father, there is somebody today who needs to be reminded that they, whatever the crucible that they're going through, that they need to hold on, not to give up. So help somebody today. Be with us all today as we leave this place. The songwriter says, dismiss us, Lord, with blessings we pray, as from thy worship we go our ways. Guide in life's conflicts all through the day, and save us in thy kingdom. Thine be the praise. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. God truly was worshipped in this house today. We thank our virtual worshippers as well as 103 of us gathered here in the house today. We just have some friends who came in maybe after the welcome, but I just wanted to introduce you to us so as i call your names won't you just give us a wave to let us know that you are the one that i'm calling the lois couple or friends or relatives j lois and t lois or is it j and j the lois raise your hand praise the lord sisters we have the Maurice, B R Mari and V Mari. R Amen, brother and sister Mari, right there. K Moise. Moise. Okay. And I would imagine your entire family. Um, A Sol Peace. I hope I don't mess up your name too much. M Ripon. K Valdi or Valley. Val C, thank you. And R and J Louis Ferdinand. Praise the Lord. So good to have you. C Marbeth. Marbeth. Am I saying that right? You may have left. C Dominic. Dominic. The Thorntons. B and K. Over there. Thank you so very much for coming. Brittany, we welcomed you earlier on. She may have left. And M. Forrest. Again, we thank everyone for coming out to worship in the house as well as our virtual worshipers. We have not overlooked Sister Wallace, who was sitting in the overflow. We thank her for coming out today. Again, we thank the Marshallex and Cheryl for taking care of mom and dad. Appreciate you. We have just so much to give God thanks for. Our own Elder Paul Clark and his wife. I cannot believe it's two and a half years. Well, almost two and a half years you've not been in the sanctuary before a Sabbath worship. Muriel, you're looking so beautiful. God is good. To see you and John, what a delight to have you both worshiping. And now, friends, because we have been reminded, I know you know this, but if you just want to stand up and declare with me Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and verse 9, turn to it and find it, or maybe we can flash it back up on the screen, because as Paul in the Bible says, and Paul Clark reiterated, Paul, you want to come up here and say something? All right. Reiterated. 
because of the mask and I still don't see them but I'm told oh yeah Ricky and Vida they play tape tennis with us uh, they're here because they heard I was preaching Ricky. just raise your hand uh, Ricky oh. and Vida thank you for coming thank you for coming amen say with us for by grace we have been saved through faith not of ourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast may God bless us as we leave and I just say as in number 6 verse 24 to 26 says may the Lord bless you and keep you may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace have a wonderful Sabbath afternoon and as we go through the main doors for our friends and our visitors, please remember to leave your tithes and offerings in the receptacle at the door. May God bless you. Please come again.